Today is Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023, and we are back to the book of Genesis. We are in Genesis chapter 37 tonight. We have been in Genesis for several months now, but we've taken a break for the past couple of Wednesdays for me to attend the Fried Hardeman University Bible Lectures down in Tennessee and then for a week of vacation. So I want to thank you tonight for allowing me to be away for a couple weeks. I enjoyed the break. It was a good series of lectures this year in the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. I was able to see some family in Nashville on my way back north. I got to spend a couple of very good days with my in-laws near Dayton, Ohio. And then I got to worship with some friends in Detroit, Michigan, who have helped us out at our youth camp every summer for a number of years now. So it was good to reconnect with them. And then from Detroit, I took the scenic route home through the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And this past Sunday, we worshipped with the church down in Janesville. I got back late on Friday night, got to recover a bit on Saturday, and then go down to worship in Janesville on Sunday. I think uh, many of you know that I preached there for a little over seven years before moving to Madison, and we just had to see some people down there, so we enjoyed being down there for a little bit. Uh, late last week, I camped in a cabin at the very top of the Keweenaw Peninsula, which would be at the northernmost point of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. So I guess I was uh, on a peninsula on a peninsula, so one peninsula jutting out uh, from another peninsula, but there were no campsites with plug-ins for my heater. And so I didn't know if I wanted to spend the night in a tent or in my car without any heat whatsoever. So I found this cabin up there at the very tip of the Keweenaw Peninsula with no electricity, but they did have a wood stove, which was awesome. We heat with wood at home, so I was very familiar with that, but uh, no cell phone service up there. They had 167 inches of snow. It was 15 degrees outside that evening when I got there, and once the sun went down, I kind of uh, whipped out the laptop and got to work on tonight's class and spent a number of hours studying and uh, preparing the notes for tonight. And so over the next several hours that evening, I studied by candlelight. I found the candle at a thrift shop on the way up there. I realized I won't really have a good source of light. Of course, headlamps and uh, all that, I was prepared for that. But I thought a candle may be appropriate. So uh, the wood stove is the glow you see on the right-hand side of the laptop in this picture. Uh, but just a great experience. I don't always give you kind of the behind-the-scenes look, but uh, this is the way tonight's class was prepared, but a very good experience uh, camping through the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, but tonight we get back to the book of Genesis, so the book of beginnings. And in just a few moments, if you're not there already, I hope you'll join me in Genesis chapter 37. And Genesis 37 really is a turning point in the book of Genesis. So... Uh, and it's also not just a turning point in the book of Genesis, it's also a, a turning point in the history of God's people. So we're introduced to a new main character in this book, uh, but we're glad that you've joined us tonight. And I, again, I hope you can join me in chapter 37. We also want to invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 930 and uh, we'll do a Bible study for about 45 minutes and then worship at 1030. We're getting back to our series on the book of Hebrews. But if you have any questions about what you see or hear in our class tonight, I want to invite you to give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. And also use the church's new website address, if you could, fourlakeschurch.org, fourlakeschurch.org. I think we still need to update that on the, the YouTube video here, but we would love to hear from you. And if you have not yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, we want to invite you to do that as well. But back to Genesis, the book of beginnings, written by Moses. We've looked at Adam and Eve, we've looked at Noah, we've looked at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and tonight we start transitioning to a new focus on Joseph. By way of very brief review, let's just bring us up to speed again on the chart. We've got the first four sons born to Leah. Rachel can't have children, so the next two are born to her maid Bilhah. We have two more born to Leah's maid Zilpah. We have three more born to Leah. And then Joseph is born to Rachel. So Joseph is Rachel's firstborn, followed by Benjamin. And I just need us to review that to kind of put Joseph in perspective here and to keep him in the proper context. So tonight we're going to get some background material on Joseph, and that'll then set us up for what happens next and really in the rest of the book of Genesis. So let's start tonight with uh, Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 4. This is our first paragraph, Genesis 37, 1 through 4. 
And as we look at these verses, I hope we keep an eye out for something that's been a problem for several generations now in this family. And it'll continue to be a problem. But this is Genesis 37, verses 1 through 4. Let's look at this paragraph together. Genesis 37, 1 through 4. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a varicolored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Up in verse 1, we have a summary bringing us up to speed on where we are in this book. We're talking about Jacob, and we find here Jacob is back in the land of Canaan, and we've already talked about why he was gone and how long he's been gone, but he's back now. And then in verse 21, we come back to a statement that's used several times in Genesis as a transition statement. Now, these are the generations of, and so we've got that early on in this book. Now, these are the generations of Adam, and then later, now these are the generations of Noah, then these are the generations of Shem, these are the generations of Ishmael, these are the generations of Isaac, and so on. And so that phrase then is something of a transition. And so here we are now transitioning to the descendants of Jacob. We've been looking at Jacob. Now we are moving on from Jacob for the most part. We'll get back to him just for a little bit. But uh, for the most part, we're, we're moving on from Jacob. And now we're looking at what comes next. And notice here, the next word is Joseph. So now we're moving on to Joseph. So again, Jacob doesn't disappear completely quite yet. But Joseph will now be the leading character for the rest of the book of Genesis. Really, chapters 37 through the end. And something that's rather unique here is that we have an age, don't we? We have an age nailed down. So the first big event in his life happens when Joseph is 17 years old. So he's still a youth, according to verse 2. He's out in the wilderness pasturing the flock with his brothers. And obviously that's a pretty big responsibility. He's out there on his own in the wilderness, and maybe they're taking turns watching these flocks. And I hope we remember that Joseph is basically the youngest, of course, with the exception of Benjamin, who's quite a bit younger than everybody else. But out there in the fields, though, Joseph is the youngest. But there's something else going on. Notice which older brothers are out there with him. The sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. So these are the two maids, the maids of Leah and Rachel, although they are described here as wives. You may remember early on when we were introduced to these two women um, that I just briefly mentioned that they functioned as wives, although technically they were uh, the servants of the actual wives, but they functioned as wives, and sometimes those terms here are used interchangeably. And I think this is mentioned here for a reason, because what does Joseph do at the end of verse 2? Well, he brings back a bad report about his older brothers to his father. And I think it's significant that these are not the uh, sons of Leah, uh, but these are the sons of the maid, so kind of his stepbrothers. And so he brings back this bad report about these older brothers to his father. And then we have the reminder at the beginning of verse 3 that Jacob, or Israel as he's called here, uh, loved Joseph more than all of his sons. And the reason is, of course, um, that he is the son of his old age. And so uh, Joseph was born when Jacob was an older man. And I think most of us as parents can probably think back to things that we might have done differently if we had parenting to do all over again. Well, I'm thinking that when you have 13 children, you can actually have (laughs) do-overs because you've had so much experience through the years. You've been doing this over and over. And so, and in my mind, as I think about the family dynamic going on here, it, it's almost like Joseph was like a grandchild. And of course, grandparents treat their grandchildren probably a bit differently than they would treat their own children. 
And so maybe there is something like that going on. Maybe there is something of uh, some amazement in Jacob's mind here. Uh, wow, I, I have a kid and, and I'm an old man now. This is an amazing thing. And so maybe he treats Joseph differently than he's treated his other sons that were born to him when he was younger. But for whatever reason, Joseph is the favorite of these children at this point. And Jacob demonstrates this, doesn't he? So this is not some, you know, quiet thought that he has on his own. Yeah, I really kind of love Joseph more than the others, but uh, let's not get that, uh, let that get out there. Uh, that's not what happens. He's public about this, isn't he? So he demonstrates that Joseph is his favorite son among all the others uh, by giving him this uh, varicolored or multicolored tunic. Translations go all over the place on that. A, a coat of sleeves, uh, different ways this is translated. But I think the point is he's special and it's obvious that he's special. And it's, this is demonstrated by this very special gift. So a tunic was a garment, almost like a robe. And it's what people would wear every day. And I'm thinking that most of these would be rather bland. Maybe the color of the wool that they were made out of. Or maybe uh, dyed some color if you had the means. But this tunic was varicolored. So many colors were involved here. This would have been very, very unusual. It would have been very expensive. And it would have attracted a whole lot of attention. So if you were walking around with a robe like that in those days... Uh, it would have been an amazing thing. People would have looked at you. Of course, today, if we go around with different color clothing, um, you know, checks or plaid or whatever, people may not think very much of it. But back in those days, to have a multicolored tunic, that, that was a big deal. Now, on top of this, we now have this favorite child, an obvious favorite child, now basically doing what? He's tattling on his older brothers, isn't he? Uh, getting them in trouble. Um, so how do we think that might have gone over? You know, imagine being the older brothers. We're out there working, we're having some independence, and our little brother, who we know is dad's favorite child, goes back to dad with some stories, and he's getting us in trouble. Well, obviously there would have been some huge resentment, and there was. Uh, they hated him, didn't they? Even to the point at the end of this passage that they couldn't even have a friendly conversation. They couldn't even talk with each other without it getting heated. So everything was confrontational, but it doesn't stop there. In fact, it's so bad in the next few verses, we can hardly make this up. <laughs> and so let's continue then with Genesis 37 verses 5 through 8. And let's notice what happens next. So not only does he tattle on his older brothers, not only is he the favorite, not only is it obvious that it's he's the favorite by having this special multicolored tunic, but let's notice... Genesis 37, verses 5 through 8. Then Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. Then his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. So Joseph has a dream. And you know, there are times when you really need to keep your dreams to yourself. And this right here is absolutely, definitely one of those times. If you have 11 older brothers who all hate you, this is a dream you might not want to share with your brothers. So he has this dream that these guys are all out in the field one day, binding grain into sheaves, so into little bundles. And the bundle representing Joseph stands up tall over the others, and his brother's bundles of grain all gather around and bow down to his. If you dream that, that may be something you may want to not want to share with your older brothers. And his brothers could hardly believe it. You can't make this up. They are, they are significantly older than Joseph. He's going around dreaming that uh, he will someday rule over his brothers, that they will all bow down to him. So it's one thing to have a dream like this, uh, but it's quite another thing altogether to tell that dream to the people who will supposedly someday bow down to you, especially if they hate you. Maybe we've seen somebody get beat up or picked on at school or in our youth, and 
And maybe you have observed a situation like that. And from your point of view, there are some things that they've done to maybe ask for it. Obviously, that's not uh, the case in all circumstances. But there are times, I think, when we may see somebody picked on when they do, in fact, do something that almost begs for this to happen. And that is absolutely what happens here. But it doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop with this. He continues on. So let's notice Genesis 37, verses 9 through 11. Genesis 37, verses 9 through 11. Now he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Once again, Joseph has another dream, and this one is similar to the first, only this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to Joseph. And even without knowing what comes later in the book, I think most of us can recognize that this is a reference to his mom and his dad and his 11 brothers. 11 is no coincidence here. Everybody gets it. This is clear to everybody who hears it. It's clear to Joseph. And so Joseph doesn't keep it private, doesn't keep this to himself, but notice he goes and he tells his father. And he tells his brothers once again. And this time his father rebukes him, just as his brothers did on the previous dream. And Jacob can't believe it either. Um, his brothers were jealous. Jacob keeps these sayings in mind. It's an interesting little phrase, isn't it? And to me, I don't know who that reminds you of. Have we seen a statement like that elsewhere in Scripture? To me, it almost reminds me of Mary, Jesus' mother. If you remember, that angel predicted the birth of Jesus and all of those things, amazing things that would happen. And I didn't look it up, but I think the text says something to the effect that Mary treasured these things in her heart. Do you remember that little passage? In other words, what the angel said didn't have this immediate fulfillment. This was not, this is what's going to happen and tonight it happened. That, that's not the way that went down. But there were some amazing things said that Mary treasured in her heart. She saved that up for later. She didn't forget about that. But Mary kept thinking through that message. She molded over, we might say, over the next several decades. And to me, that seems to be what happens here with Jacob when he hears this. So he doesn't forget it. He rebukes his son, but he kind of remembers that, keeps that in the back of his mind for later. Well, let's continue with Genesis 37, verses 12 through 14, the next paragraph. Genesis 37, verses 12 through 14. Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, Go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Well, basically, Israel assumes the best. The older brothers are out there pasturing the flock in Shechem. And Israel sends young Joseph to go check on them to see how they are doing. Well, you know, this has not gone too well in the past, but maybe Israel needs to know the truth. And maybe he knows that Joseph will tell it like it is. He's told the truth in the past. He's had the courage to uh, tell on his brothers and uh, spread some stuff back to his father. And so it happens again. He sends Joseph. Joseph agrees. He makes his way down to Shechem. And this is where we come to one of the most unusual passages anywhere in the book of Genesis, just a, a strange little paragraph here in the middle of this chapter. It's not really, uh, it kind of stands on its own, I guess I would want to say. But this is Genesis 37. Let's move ahead to verses 15 through 17. Genesis 37, verses 15 through 17. A man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, what are you looking for? He said, I am looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. Then the man said, they have moved from here. For I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. 
Apparently, Joseph is having a hard time finding his brothers. Of course, his father sent him to Shechem, but he gets to Shechem and they're not there. And so Joseph appears to be wandering around aimlessly in the wilderness. This is a huge area. So he's just walking around looking for his brothers. And the chances are not great that he's just going to run into them randomly. So out here in the middle of nowhere, Joseph runs into this man. And actually, if we read the text carefully, we find the text says that a man found him, doesn't it? It's a little bit strange, isn't it? So it's almost as if this man was on a mission to find Joseph. And so he finds him, he starts the conversation, he learns that Joseph is looking for his brothers, and the man then gives some instruction. They move from here. I heard them talking about going to Dothan, but I think it's strange, first of all, that the man is looking for Joseph. Joseph isn't looking for the man. But secondly, that he knows that those guys are Joseph's brothers. And then thirdly, that he just so happens to remember where these random guys in the wilderness were talking about going next. So there are almost too many coincidences in this little paragraph. As I said, this is a very strange, very unusual uh, paragraph. And so my question is, as I'm reading this passage over and over, as I'm reading this passage in the middle of nowhere in a cabin in the dark in northern Michigan, my question is, who is this guy? Who is this guy who is looking for Joseph and finds him in the wilderness? Who is he? And I would also ask, was he even a man at all? Could this have been another angel in the book of Genesis? Could this be an appearance of God? as God appeared to Abraham. I mean, then again, maybe it was just some random guy in the wilderness. I don't know. We're not told exactly. Uh, but to me, it sure seems like there is more to it than that. Uh, the bottom line is that Joseph, because of this man giving him instruction, ends up finding his brothers at Dothan. Well, as we think about this, as we let this paragraph sink in, as we allow the, the ancient words to affect our lives today, here's a thought question. Knowing what we know now, what would have happened if Joseph had never found his brothers? What happens if Joseph just wanders off here never to be seen again, lost in the wilderness? What happens if Joseph doesn't get lost, but what if he goes back to his dad with no report? I don't know, dad. Couldn't find him. Sorry. What happens? Well, God's people starve to death in the upcoming famine, don't they? There's no Messiah. Do we understand how important it is for Joseph to find his brothers? I think we understand the importance of what this random, strange man in the wilderness does here. Later in his life, in fact, Joseph realizes that his brothers intended to do evil against him. But he also realizes that God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. I know I'm kind of spoiling this. I'm assuming most of you join us, joining us tonight know what happens in the rest of the book of Genesis. If you don't, I'm sorry. Just hang on. We'll get to that. But I want to emphasize tonight, based on looking at these few verses here in the middle of it, God has a plan. And Joseph getting lost in the wilderness looking for his brothers is not a part of that plan. And so, therefore, we have this supposedly random guy finding him and telling him exactly where to go. And that's interesting, isn't it? I think we see an example here of God's providential care and making sure that the story ends that the way it needs to end. So let's continue on then with Genesis 37, verses 18 through 24. Genesis 37, 18 through 24. When they saw him from a distance, and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and we will say, A wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of their hands and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the varicolored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. 
Now the pit was empty without any water in it. So the brothers then see Joseph coming from a distance. How did they know it was Joseph? Because he was the only guy in the world with a multicolored tunic. Thanks, Dad. That kind of helped, helped the situation in a bad way, didn't it? So they're all out there in the middle of nowhere. They have zero accountability. They are days travel away from their dad. They can do anything. They can do whatever they want. And so the idea is that they kill Joseph. They maybe throw him in this pit. They say a wild animal eat a, ate him. And then the text tells us the, uh, uh, the reason for all this anger, it's the dreams. That they can't stand this. However, Reuben speaks up. He objects to taking Joseph's life. And instead, he suggests they just throw him in the pit. And so I think Reuben then, as the firstborn, seems to have more of a level head here. Hopefully some firstborn children in the uh, uh, audience tonight may, may think, yeah, I, I'm like that. <laughs> I'm more responsible, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but however, let's also notice Reuben's motivation for this new plan. What was Reuben thinking? At the end of verse 22, Reuben, what was he going to do? He was going to rescue Joseph out of the pit and bring him back to Jacob. In other words, Reuben, I think, secretly wanted to be the hero. You guys do whatever you want to do, but then he's thinking in his mind, I'm going to be the hero, rescue Joseph, I'm going to bring him back to dad, and I'm going to be dad's favorite now because I rescued his favorite son. So if I rescue dad's favorite, uh, then maybe there's something in it for me. But nevertheless, this is what they do. They take the tunic and they throw Joseph into the pit. However, before Reuben can actually be the hero here and secretly or whatever bring um, Joseph back to dad, we have another twist that happens in this story. So let's continue on with uh, Genesis 37, 25 through 28. Genesis 37, 25 through 28. Then they sat down to eat a meal. And as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming down from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. And then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. Well, I hope we notice in verse 25 that as their brother is in the pit, these men sit down to eat a meal. No concern whatsoever. They're going to chow down. They're having a grand old time. But as they're eating, they see this uh, caravan getting near, passing by. And these are Ishmaelites. And I think I've missed this in the past, but who are the Ishmaelites? Well, they're basically their long-lost distant cousins, aren't they? Uh, these people are family. And we should note here that the terms Midianite and Ishmaelite are sometimes used interchangeably in Scripture. Some people may, uh, skeptics may look at this, oh, look, a contradiction. We got, you know, Ishmaelites versus Midianite and all that. Um, but they are used interchangeably. We've got an example of this over in Judges 8. Verses 22, 24, and 26. You remember the record of Gideon and his 300 men uh, defeating the enemy? I kind of want to get away from Genesis just for a few seconds here. Let me read uh, Judges 8. And notice how those these terms are used interchangeably. Judges 8, starting in verse 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son, also your son's son, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Yet Gideon said to them, I would request of you that each of you give me an earring from his spoil. For they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. They said, we will surely give them. So they spread out a garment and every one of them threw an earring there from his spoil. The weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple robes which were on the kings of Midian and besides the neck bands that were on their camels' necks. So I just hope we notice over there in the book of Judges that Gideon defeated the Midianites and these Midianites wore gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites and they gave up the jewelry that was on the kings of Midian. 
And I just hope we notice there is some back and forth there between the Midianites and the Ishmaelites. But nevertheless, these people are bringing loads of good to trade with Egypt back in Genesis here. Aromatic gum and balm and myrrh. A lot of the commentaries are pointing out these were uh, spices pretty much that were used in the uh, burial rituals, making mummies, we would say. And so these guys are, are trading with the Egyptians. Judah is the guy who speaks up with the bright idea. And notice his motivation. Um, he would be in favor of killing his own brother, but there's no profit in it. <laughs> what profit is there in this? Well, what are we going to get out of it if he's dead? So as I read this, if they had figured out a way to profit off of his death, maybe they would have killed him. However, instead of killing him, they trade him, don't they? They sell him into slavery. They, they sell him as a slave. So the Midianite traders pass by, they help him get out of the pit, and they sell their brother to the Ishmaelites, who then bring him down to Egypt. So this is how Joseph ends up in Egypt. This is a very important part of us uh, knowing in this story. Well, now, of course, they need to explain this to their father. How are they going to communicate to their father? Yeah, we sold your favorite son uh, to the Egyptians. So let's continue on to with uh, Genesis 37, 29 through 36. Genesis 37, 29 through 36. Now Reuben returned to the pit. And behold, Joseph was not in the pit. So he tore his garments. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is not there. As for me, where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in blood. And they sent the varicolored tunic and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, Pharaoh's officer, the captain of the bodyguard. Well, this is where we learn that Reuben must not have been in on this deal to sell Joseph into slavery. Remember, this group of brothers probably taking turns, feeding and taking care of the sheep. So Reuben wasn't there for that decision. So he gets back from his shift and he's torn up over this. You know, how am I going to tell dad? I, I'm the one who has to answer to dad. So he's the firstborn in theory. He's responsible. He knows that dad will ask him, where's Joseph? So they need to explain it. And this is where they come up with the plan to deceive their father. They slaughter a goat. They dip this varicolored tunic in blood. They bring the tunic to dad. And they don't exactly... Yes, they do lie. Um, not as outright as it could have been, but there's a family history of this, isn't there? So they, they slaughter the goat, they dip it in blood, they take it to dad. We found this. Uh, please examine it, look at it carefully uh, to see whether it's your son's tunic or not. They know his conclusion. They know what he's, he, he knows the tunic. He made it. He gave it to him. So it's obvious that it is. Jacob comes to the conclusion that he's been led to believe that a wild animal has killed his son. And so he mourns the death of his son, Joseph, for many days. And what is truly disturbing is that his family tries to comfort him, knowing what they've done. But he refuses to be comforted. One thing I find interesting here is the reference to daughters. I don't know if any of you caught that. Uh, but as far as we know, he's only had Dinah as a daughter. So this is either speaking figuratively, this is just like a generic way of saying children, referring to his 11 sons and one daughter, or he has other daughters that we don't know about, or a third possibility, there were servants in the house who were considered his sons and daughters, even though they were not his literal children. That may be, those are several ways we might, uh, might deal with that. So as Jacob is mourning, we have this meanwhile statement down at the end, down in verse 36, knowing that the Midianites sell Joseph to Potiphar down in Egypt. And this is where we learn that Potiphar is an officer. He is the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard. Basically, 
What is this man's position? If, we, if he were serving in our country today, what is this guy doing? Basically, we would refer to Potiphar as the head of the secret service, wouldn't we? Potiphar is responsible for protecting the king of Egypt. That's a pretty powerful position. And Joseph ends up being sold to Potiphar. Well, this brings us to the end of our study tonight. And like I said at the beginning of class, this chapter is a turning point. We have a shift to focus uh, away from Judah to Joseph. We also have the explanation concerning how Joseph gets down to Egypt. And then we also have some background information on Joseph's brothers. And that'll be very significant a little bit later in the book of Genesis. So next week in Genesis 38, we have an interesting little side note on Jacob telling us something of who he is. And then we plan on getting back to uh, all Joseph after that. So we'll have a little uh, a little blip, a little blurb on uh, Jacob next week, and then Joseph from there on out. But thank you so much for joining us tonight. I hope to see most of you in person this coming Lord's Day at 930. Um, I believe that we're starting a new study of the second half of the book of Isaiah. But again, I haven't been here for a couple weeks, so I wouldn't swear to that, but I think that's where we're headed. And then after class, we plan on coming together at 1030 for the worship assembly, where we uh, plan on picking up with the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 3. So if you want to read through Hebrews again, that would be one way of coming prepared for worship this coming Lord's Day. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your providential care of your people in ancient times. We read passages like this, and you certainly seem to have worked behind the scenes in ways to protect Joseph and to ultimately save your people and us through the birth of your son. We look at what we've learned tonight, Father. We're also encouraged that you have promised to be with us, just as you have promised to be with Joseph. And so tonight, we're thankful for your providential care in our lives. So many times we may not see you working at this present time, but we look back and it's so obvious that you knew what was best for us all along. Tonight, Father, we ask for greater faith that we would trust your plan for our lives. We therefore pray for honest and obedient hearts, that we would listen even when it's difficult, even when we're distracted by the world around us. Father, you know what we struggle with. You know the difficult things that we face. We've had people we love endure some very difficult health challenges and surgeries over the past several weeks. Several are facing some unknowns right now at this moment, waiting for test results, waiting not knowing what the outcome might be. And so tonight, Father, we pray for peace. We pray for opportunities to serve and obey, even when we don't know what might happen next. But we do know you, Father, and that means everything to us. Tonight, we continue to mourn the, mourn the loss of our sister, Kathy, knowing by faith that the loss to us is only very temporary, and yet it still hurts. Bless Stuart and Denise as they lean on you in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, who has defeated death through the resurrection, giving us hope. We come to you in, tonight in his name. Amen.